Greetings, comrades. This is uh, my attempt to make another special episode because talking just about Stalin all the time gets sort of boring. But it seems that this will turn into a mini series of sorts until I get this whole thing over with because otherwise we will get to Dan Carlin lengths of episodes, to be honest. And this episode itself will have quite a large introduction, and I'm sorry about that, but I promise you that this will tie back into everything by the end. I promise. So, uh, I recently read an article by Juan Andres Olson, who is an elder member of the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C. And this article was published here in Latvia in our biggest and most trustworthy news site, Delphi LV, and that inspired me to do this episode and start writing about this subject. The article was about how Putin's power is actually weaker than it might seem. Well, in general, that's nothing new to my listeners, as we have explored his regime's internal weaknesses and problems in the past, but it was nice that someone else talks about that, not just an independent podcaster from Latvia, who is risking to sound insane when he says things like that. In short, Olsun states that Putin basically runs his country in a semi-feudal, kind of like Roman patron-client relationships way. And it is biting him in the back now, as his, by now, very rich clients, the members of the elite, are no longer safe about their properties and money. And so, they are forced to keep their assets abroad, and Putin doesn't like this at all. What Olsund does more than I have in the past is that he strictly categorizes this country-running scheme in certain circles of power. Uh, Namely three, which are the state, the state-run businesses, like Gazprom, and the quote-unquote private enterprises of the loyalists. Now, obviously, this process began during the time when Putin was the leader of the FSB, in 1998 to 1999, and was basically adapting the old KGB structures to run the country. And during the period which is covered in Anna Politkovskaya's book, A Russian Diary, which by now should be intimately familiar to my patrons, and where she talks about all of this from 2000 to 2004, he only expanded and consolidated these structures of power, beginning with overtaking the Russian television in the summer of 2000. See, I remember when NTV and RTR were actually great television, with investigative journalism and everything, guys. I I remember those days, I watched that television, that's how I learned Russian. Now, after this, the so-called vertical of power came into being, with him, Putin, vastly increasing the presidential powers, and he instituted his so-called dictatorship of the law in the courts which has by now led to an acquittal rate of 0.07% in modern-day Russian courts. And uh, when in the 2003 parliamentary elections, the United Russia acquired control over the Gosduma and the Federation Council, which is their equivalent to Senate, he put three very nice men, uh, ex-KGB generals, in the positions of the real power of the country, namely in the highest security council. Our nice men, by the way, were Sergei Ivanov, Nikolai Patrushev, and Alexei Bortnikov. Very nice men, cool heads, hot hearts, clean hands, Dzerzhinsky would be proud. Then, he put some of his closest older pals in the CEO positions in the major state-owned businesses. So we have Igor Shechin, who is leading Rosneft, Alexei Miller, who is running Gazprom, and Sergei Chemezov from Rostec. In the end, Putin created large corporations, which have only gained power during this time because of easily accessible and cheap state resources, which have often resulted in monopolies in their respective sectors. Now, as this is basically thought as a way to pocket tons of money for their owners and a way of securing power for Putin, instead of, you know, ways of creating economic growth, they're not really bothered by such trivial things as competition, innovations, productivity, and growth of production. Loyalty to the regime, however, is paramount. And then, there's the third circle of power, consisting of the most powerful of Putin's close friends. The four most important ones being Gennady Timochenko, Arkady Rotenberg, Yuri Kovalchuk, and Nikolai Shamalov, and their respective businesses. Now, these are the people who are usually called the kleptocrats, but Putin's made sure that everything that they do is technically legal. For example, his buddies are allowed to buy actives and assets and shares of the state companies for reasonable prices, and obviously they get various contracts on services and buildings and projects and other state-funded things without any public contests. 
Now, Olsen here in this article compares this Putin system to the one under the Tsar until the so-called great reforms of 1860s, which actually do not agree with. This is why I will speak about the Soviet economy and the differences between what it was on paper and what really happened and try to sort of explain where Putin comes from. As remember, he was and still is a KGB colonel, with every imaginable consequence that it entails. And for those who are starting to panic right now, no, this is important, as one does not simply quit being in the KGB. And uh, how whomever tells you otherwise is just lying, because this fact was very well known in the Soviet era among literally everyone. Everyone, including those in the rival other main intelligence service, the GRU, who, by the way, got assigned ex-KGB members as their directors, while KGB was assigned ex-GRU guys, so that they couldn't conspire for a coup. But I'll get to that, D don't worry, I have a planned Soviet spy episode, maybe it's gonna be a collaboration, but let's keep that a secret. Anyhow, let's finish up with what Olson says about the weaknesses of Putin's administration. <clears throat> Basically, because Putin has consolidated all the power in his own hands, and as he's just assigned his loyal buddies in positions of power, some of his buddies are worried that Putin giveth, Putin take the way. Because we have also seen some of the really, really rich and corrupt CEOs getting their toys taken from them. So, his friends know that the only place where to keep their monies is in foreign banks. And thanks to the fact that ruble, modern-day ruble, is fully convertible, and because Russia has no restrictions on capital flow, they can fully direct their income to the offshore tax havens. Which, according to Olsund, has created the fourth circle of power, specifically these offshore tax oases themselves, which Putin doesn't control. And they are not as safe as they used to be, thanks to Panama Papers and many other efforts. For one, thanks to the Financial Action Task Force, even Swiss banks aren't completely anonymous anymore, and many of the tiny island countries also have been made totally unsafe for illegal money. And here, Olson then let this be on his consciousness, as I can't guarantee the truthfulness of these uh, statements and his information, says that it's basically only the United States of America and United Kingdom where the money can be kept now, because these governments allow the influx of anonymous money in the said countries. He also states that every year in the USA, through the opaque bank accounts of various law firms, tens of billions of dollars are being laundered. Seems crazy, but hey, remember Enron and Arthur Anderson? This podcast remembers, because we are actually interested in economic history. And even though, because of the sanctions after the Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014, all the assets of Putin's bodies in the, in the USA and EU should be frozen, very few of those have ever actually been found. Now, I do have to say here that Latvia, my own country, is a popular place for the transfer of such assets, and it's a problem that my government's trying to solve, but like with most things that our government does, they are as competent as a dead fish that's nailed to a wall and is now squeaking. So, Olson states that this needs to change, and that there should be more actions taken by the respective governments, and according to this, he actually praises the bill that was signed by President Trump in the 2nd of August, which demands a comprehensive investigation to be enacted towards <clears throat> the highest officials and oligarchs of the Russian Federation, including their partners, friends, and relatives, and their assets in the next 180 days. And well, a veteran in Russian politics. Liberal... Leonid Guzman has stated that, quote, <clears throat> According to our state propaganda, Russia is a very valuable country with vast natural resources, but extremely fragile at the same time. A weird construct that anything can destroy, starting from fighting against corruption and ending with attempts to fire kleptocratic bureaucrats. <clears throat> because everyone around in Russia is now screaming about, you know, oh no, fighting against corruption and Western agencies and such will totally destroy our country. So, maybe Olsund has a point there, but, but, what I drew from all of this is that this is, well, actually quite similar to what was going on in the Soviet era. Just, you know, adapted to capitalism, it involves money this time, and is more centralized. Basically, what, what is going on is a spiritual successor of the Soviet era way of doing things with a lot more power. And this is where we finally come to Soviet economy. Because, to fully understand what's going on now, and to get some context, we do have to go back in time to where other KGB people 
we're running the show. So, we have to start with finding out what the Soviets said about their own economy from official sources. Basically, we have to start with understanding what the word economy and economics even means in the Soviet system, as you'll be surprised to find out that it is not a money-based system. No, seriously, because money in this environment is just a tool to distribute the goods based on the amount of work that a given person inputs. Okay, it's not as simple, but think about it this way. The ruble is actually way, way closer to a company script, which is the stuff that some companies use to pay their employees with, which could be only spent in the company stores, rather than to any real, actual, convertible currency. And that's the Soviet ruble there. The real value in Soviet era, and how the system operated, was in United States dollars or Swiss francs. But again, I'm running ahead of myself. Luckily, I have the <clears throat> Latvian Soviet Encyclopedia right here. Official state-produced encyclopedia, and it had many, many volumes and tried to cover literally everything. That's what we used before Google. And the volume 3, which runs from <clears throat> J to Hein, is the one that has the section about what economics are. And take note, this was printed in 1983, so just a few years before Glasnost and Perestroika. And this is what it has to say and how it defines the thing. <clears throat> For one, economics actually have two meanings here, and neither of which makes much sense. The first definition is, quote, The total sum of all the production forces which represent a certain level of productive force level of advancement. And it creates the economical structure of a given society, the real basis upon which the judicial and political systems are being built upon, and for which certain forms of the societal structure are related to. Now, this definition obviously comes from Marx and is noted as, su noted as such, and what this means is that, for Marx, the economical forces are the ones upon which every society is built upon. Not to get deep into Marxism, but he basically states that society goes from tribal to feudal, then to capitalistic, and then finally to socialistic economic model of functioning, and that's, that's the natural way of things, and obviously he treats it as fact and science, because here we have to start talking about what historical law actually means, and I probably should make an episode on Marxism philosophy as such. But, but what interests us more here is the second definition of economics, which is more practical and similar to what you probably would expect, but only similar. Quote, Economics is the study of a total economy of a nation or specific region of the world, or maybe the whole world. And here it becomes fun. <clears throat> In the basis of capitalistic economy is the private property. The growth of this way of economics is controlled by the capitalist economical laws and paradigms. It is typical for capitalist economies to have high inequality both in growth and end results, disproportionality, which in the cases of capitalist state monopolies, only worsens over time. For the developed capitalist countries, it is typical to have a high development level of production forces, societal course of production, and, opposing that, a private capitalism form of business. Now, this obviously looks like a word salad to me, but whatever. Moving on. <clears throat> the basis for a socialist form of economy is the commonality of the means of production. Its growth is determined by the basic laws and paradigms of socialist economics. The societal production growth is proportional, planned, with a focus of a harmonic, constant growth of the quality of life among the proletariat. And here is the really fun kicker from this encyclopedia. Quote, Socialist economy and form of property owning is better than the capitalist one because it provides the possibility of unlimited economic growth. Also, socialist economical integration really, really provides the best conditions for the growth of both the whole world socialism and each individual socialist country. Uh, are you are you laughing already? Well, if not, here's what comes next. <clears throat> The economy of the Soviet Union started to grow after the October Revolution and was strengthened in the period of the building of socialism. It matured around the 60s. And uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's when Khrushchev started to export the Soviet oil and gas and all the natural resources, for which Uncle Joe would have ice picked him personally, as he uh, personally thought that exporting the natural resources instead of produced goods is like selling your, your land to the enemy, which he hated that. And he did this, Khrushchev did this, to import grain to try to feed the massive army and the people. 
even though previously Russia and the region had been exporting grain elsewhere, but uh, nobody cared at the time, so it's matured in, matured in the 60s. Great. Glorious. Continuing. <clears throat> The modern Soviet economics are defined by a highly advanced materially technical basis. The maturing of social relationships between the means of production, whatever that means, <clears throat> and high quality of life for the citizens of Soviet Union. Woohoo! <claps> Praise the party! Praise Stalin! Praise glorious communism! Yay! Now, this article also quotes Lenin at length from his pamphlet. <clears throat> Economics and Politics in the Era of the Dictatorship of the Proletariat. Uh, this text, by the way, is taken from the website Marxists.org, as they have wonderful English translations of most Soviet writings, and I like to criticize tankies using the materials that they publish and translate themselves. It's easier that way and brings a certain level of irony here. So, Lenin writes, and this, this part of the article uh, is directly in the encyclopedia quoted from this... <clears throat> Theoretically, there can be no doubt that between capitalism and communism, there lies a definite transition period which must combine the features and properties of both these forms of social economy. This transition period has to be a period of struggle between dying capitalism and ascendant communism, or in other words, between capitalism which has been defeated but not destroyed, and communism which has been born but is still very feeble. The necessity for a whole historical era distinguished by these transitional features should be obvious not only to Marxists, but to any educated person who is in any degree acquainted with the theory of development. Yet all the talk on the subject of the transition to socialism, which we hear from present-day pity bourgeoisie democrats, and such in spite of their spurious socialist label, are all the readers of the Second International, including such individuals as MacDonald, Jean Lognet, Kautsky, and Friedrich Adler. And this is marked by a company complete disregard of this obvious truth. Pity bourgeoisie democrats are distinguished by an aversion to cross-class struggle, by their dreams of avoiding it. Uh, that is to say, uh, obviously, these, these bourgeoisie social democrats are evil because they do not want to starve millions and kill all the kulaks and, you know, do massive shootings of their own people, which is uh, bad because they don't understand that this struggle should definitely happen. But that's, that's a comment from me. <clears throat> By their efforts to smooth over, to reconcile, to remove sharp corners. Such democrats, therefore, either avoid recognizing any necessity for a whole histori historical period of transition from capitalism to communism, or regard it as their duty co to concoct schemes for reconciling the two contending forces instead of leading the struggle of one of those forces. And also, uh, this is again from the encyclopedia, <clears throat> socialism means the abolition of classes. In order to abolish classes, it is necessary, first, to overthrow the landowners and capitalists. This part of our task has been accomplished, but it is only a part, and moreover, not the most difficult part. In order to abolish classes, it is necessary, secondly, to abolish the difference between factory owner and peasant, to make workers of all of them. This cannot be done all at once. This task is comparably more difficult, and will, of necessity, take a long time. It is not a problem that can be solved by overthrowing a class. It can be solved only by the organizational reconstruction of the whole social economy. By a transition from individual, disunited, pity commodity production to a large-scale social production. This transition must, of necessity, by be extremely protracted. It may only be delayed and complicated by hasty and incautious administrative and legislative measures. It can be accelerated only by affording such assistance to the peasant as will enable him to effect an immense improvement in his whole farming technique to reform it radically. In order to solve the second and most difficult part of the problem, the proletariat, after having defeated the bourgeoisie, must unswervingly conduct its policy towards the peasantry among the fun following fundamental lines. The proletariat must separate, demarcate the working peasant from the peasant owner, the peasant worker from the peasant huckster, the peasant who lamers from the peasant who profiteers. In this demarcation lies the whole essence of socialism. Or so Lenin says, and this encyclopedia is, well, basically trying to sell me that the whole essence of socialism is for the poor peasants to shoot the rich peasants and take their stuff. And distribute it among themselves. Well, that's, that's fun. Okay. And now, now, now we have to, now to have to actually talk about, well, how this redistribution from the rich to the poor actually was going on in the Soviet Union. And like I said, this, this probably will, uh, well, not end just in this episode, but uh, we have to start somewhere. 
And where better to start than with the glorious leaders of the socialist countries. And I think that this is the nice time for a few jokes, because I've, I've been pretty enthusiastic in this episode and kind of active, because I've got a lot of text and grounds to cover. So here's one. Soviet peoples are divided into blacks and the reds. The blacks drive black Volgas, buy whatever they want in the black market, and eat black caviar. While the reds, on the meantime, on the red dates of the calendar, get to march with red flags in the red square. And here's another one. <clears throat> Brezhnev is giving a speech in a meeting of workers in the factory. And he declares, Comrades, in a few years we will live better than ever. Uh, and, and there's a silent single voice from the auditorium, which is like, Well, that, that's nice, but um, Comrade Brezhnev, how, how, about, how about the rest of us, the, the workers? Uh, and of course, uh, sclerosis in Soviet style. A retired man is standing in his coat with an empty bag in his hand and, and just wondering, wait, wait a second, did, did I go to the store already? Or did I just return from it? See, the poverty and scarcity of food in the general population, especially in the very late, year, very late years of the USSR, went so far that the following is probably one of the most terrible jokes. Quote, So, what will we do after the implementation of the new food program? Huh. Why? Count those who have managed to survive, of course. But let's get to the point here. And I have some interesting sources. For example, this one uh, is, is from the alcohol historian Irina Petrenko. And this is just, just a tiny detail from the history so that you understand that in the meantime, while um, the Soviet population was, was kind of starving and suffering and there was nothing in the stores. And I should probably go into more detail here about this, but, uh, I, I made a whole episode about everyday life in the Soviet Union, how it was like there. Uh, you should, you should probably go and check that one out if you haven't already, because I, I don't want to repeat <laughs> my whole episode another time completely here. So uh, go and check it out. I think it was either 14th one or 16th one. Just just find it or, or iTunes on our webpage. But uh, while the Soviet people were not living in the best conditions possible, uh, here's what Irina Petrenko writes. And she writes about Leonid Brezhnev. And uh, he used to have fondness for cigarettes called Novosh, which is the news. The tobacco for these cigarettes, by the way, used to be delivered directly from Virginia, USA. Deluxe cigarettes, these cigarettes, were complete with charcoal filters made of juniper coal. And uh, a ton, a ton of this whole juniper plant puts out only the 30 kilograms of finest coal. Soviet Soviet leaders, you see, they smoked special cigarettes and drank special vodka. Another leader, Nikita Khrushchev, ordered to develop a special recipe for the high-class alcohol beverages. Khrushchev demanded that the political elite should not suffer from hangovers after strong drinks, and he really enjoyed his strong drinks just like everyone else in the Soviet Union. The project to create the special Kremlin vodka at that time involved the most brilliant Soviet scientists, several closed scientific laboratories. In addition to that, the research gave start to the establishment of two institutes of alcohol, one in Moscow and another one in Kiev. And here you ask, well, it must have costed a lot. Well, here's the thing. Did you not notice that in the description of economics in this encyclopedia, which I gave you before, there was no mention of money? It was never about the money. What money? Money means nothing in the Soviet Union, and like I mentioned in the second episode, this is the biggest mistake that Western analysts make. Because the Soviet state was itself the producer of money and the producer of goods. Everything was measured in goods, and everything was done well. You know, you, the, the Khrushchev said so, th- that therefore it must be done. Like, for example... You know, a certain, a certain kind of, a certain tank company wants to move its tanks by ship to some friendly neighbors in Cuba. So the the Soviet tank company goes to the local, uh, to the local kind of transportation company, also state state owned, just like the tank company, and they of course have to move it because Khrushchev said so. So they go to this shipping company and ask them, well, we need to move, uh, say, ten thousand tanks to Cuba. How much will that cost? And the, the the shipping company says, Why, of course, it'll cost 9 million rubles. It's going to be great. We need this much for gasoline and we need this much money from you. So, you know, according to Khrushchev's orders, obviously, as they need to move the tanks, they go to Khrushchev and say, Well, well now, the, the shipment company asked us for 9 million rubles. And Khrushchev says, Well, nice. 
from the from the countries from the country's financial resources Khrushchev gives to the nice men in the tank company nine million rubles. With these nine million rubles they go to the shipping company. And, you know, everyone's happy. The shipping company accepts 9 million rubles and the transfer happens and our nice, friendly republic in Cuba gets their 10,000 tanks. Then, the shipping company goes to Khrushchev and says, Hey, this year we made 9 million rubles from this great order. Here you go. There they go back into the governmental coffers. And Khrushchev is happy because, you know, tanks have been moved to Cuba. And, you know, technically, economic growth on paper has been achieved. Glorious. Because what money? Money is unimportant unless it comes to spying. But again, I think I'm going to touch spying in a separate episode. At any rate, this happened with everything, and uh, I just want to focus some emphasis on some important details about the life of these glorious leaders. You see, and vodka is important, kind of, the the notion here about what was actually going on. See, the communist elite vodka was supposed to be crystal clear, made of highest quality alcohol and water. In addition, the beverage was supposed to taste perfectly. No sugar, honey, glucose, or other softeners. Scientists started conducting numerous experiments with alcohol and water, cooperating with the national defense industry, and uh, they, they they actually had advice from the GRU, the Central Intelligence Administration, kind of the Central Intelligence Directorate. They really used GRU, the military intelligence, to steal the secrets of making better, cleaner vodka from the Western countries. The alcohol for the Kremlin vodka, by the way, and interestingly enough, was thoroughly purified to remove all admixtures. Water, by the way, was processed to have its memory erased. This technology was also used to produce drinking water for the Soviet elite. See, at that time, at this time also, Khrushchev personally believed in psychics and many supernatural phenomenon, and also funded a lot of this supernatural, uh, supernatural research. And, you know, CIA also dabbled in this. It was kind of popular during the Cold War. And at this point, Khrushchev and, you know, some Soviet scientists, also incompetent people just being put there because, you know, they knew someone up higher above, they truly do believe that water is capable of saving information, which might then leave genetic traces in the human body, which could then be used to kill Soviet leaders. Uh, therefore, you know, if, if you laugh today about this memory water, which is hilarious in itself, then understand that Soviets took that stuff very seriously. Especially since the Soviets and the government also believed that it was the Jews who killed Stalin by poisoning him with impure water. Which is kind of uh, crazy and insane, but hey, this is, this is why most Soviet people kind of like the Jews, actually. Which is kind of crazy, if you think about it. Now, this luxury vodka was produced under one and the same temperature in special thermal chambers. The Soviet political elite was, elite was very happy about all the situation, obviously. Academician Kapitsa said that the Kremlin vodka was very easy and pleasant to drink. Quote, I had to change my attitude to alcohol drinks because of the vodka I tried in the Kremlin. It did not make me drunk, but it gave me a wonderful feeling of cheerfulness. It tasted remarkably. I cannot say that I drank too much of it, but I had no hangover in the morning at all. And you know, in the end, this uh, alcohol history story is quite interesting because the fate of the Kremlin vodka became kind of rather vague in the post perestroik period. See, rumors say that politicians were fighting for it when they were dividing the wealth of the Communist Party. Far-sighted <clears throat> businessmen from the KGB administration took possession of the enormous technological and scientific base, and the Kremlin vodka went into the background. It appeared again after political and financial shocks in Russia when business again started developing in the country. And this development and production of this elite vodka was encoded as SV, Special Vodka. The SV vodka was produced for export to Germany and Cuba. One of the factories which produced the Kremlin vodka, by the way, was built in Ukraine, and after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Russian government tried to bring the plant back to Russia in a special operation, but Ukrainian officials did not, w- did not want to kind of leave it, they leave it back to the Russians. So, it was decided to keep the factory in Ukraine, and it was officially split, the whole property was split between the two countries. And that is amazing, because this is how much vodka was there. Like, they couldn't even drink regular vodka. They were so high above everyone else that they drank this super special turbo scientific vodka of doom, which I would really like to try sometime. But, but, this is just one slice of life and one, one story of extreme non-socialistic actions. 
even though they preached utter austerity and socialism back then. I would like to speak about, uh, about next about the Duchess, the very famous Duchess, and for that I shall be using <clears throat> Ilya Zemtsov's uh, part in the Encyclopedia of Soviet Life, where he writes about Duchess and the private country houses of the Soviet leaders. So, here is from Ilya Zemtsov on Duchess. <clears throat> Dachas were an out-of-town summer houses. A dacha can be technically anything from a squalid one-room hut without water, electricity, or heating, to a palatial mansion complete with servants, watchmen, and a private beach and wood. The party elite and those who protected it, i.e. high-ranking members of the secret police and army officers, received villas with grounds of several hectares that sometimes included a grove of trees, a tennis court, a swimming pool, and a sauna. Private roads guarded by police watchmen protected residents from the curiosity of passers-by. To, to enter, one needed a special pass or pi- prior permission of the dacha resident. Many dachas are located in the area 20 to 30 kilometers southwest, southwest of Moscow, near the, the railroad stations of Barvicha, Zhukovsky, and Vnukovo. Similar villas can be found in picturesque spots outside every major Soviet city. Dachas were allocated according to rank. The type, size, decor, and location all depended on the owner's status. It would, for example, be unthinkable for a Politburo member to own the same type of dacha as a Politburo candidate. Gorbachev's summer residence was a 10 room flat-footed, California-style dacha, which previously belonged to Chernenko, who inherited it from Andropov, who inherited it from Brezhnev. It was located 25 kilometers west of Moscow, in the settlement of Usova, near the Moscow River. It was surrounded by a 3-meter-high cast iron fence. In addition, the Soviet leader had an estate in Zavidovo, where he, co- where he could hunt and fish. For rest and relaxation, he also had villas at Oreanda in Crimea and Pitsunda on the Baltic on the Black Sea coast, plus another one on the Baltic coast and a Finnish-style cottage on the Karelian Peninsula. Nor were the other members of the Politburo left out in distribution of dachas. There too, whether located by calm or rushing rivers or in valleys or mountainous areas, were inevitably isolated from the rest of the world. Their luxury was hidden behind a wall of secrecy. All the Soviet elite had things to hide, particularly the privileges they standed to lose. From time to time, the dacha dwellers <clears throat> could recall some of the communist commandments which they expounded before the people and by which themselves they were supposed to stand, stand in their lives. I.e., according to Engels, quote, private pe- property should be abolished, all property should be held in common. And from the Literaturnaya Gazeta uh, in the 18th February 1981, uh, which is here in this very same article in, en- in the Soviet Encyclopedia. <clears throat> The Leninists' CPSU District Party Bureau severely embraced the communist A. Koholov and had a reprimand inserted in his personal file for having abused his official position while building his dacha. A landowner's house that was burned down during the revolution once stood in the plot now occupied by five cooperative dachas. And <clears throat> in the 1960s, dacha construction in Baku became very widespread. Who built these dachas? For the most part, man- managers and intellectuals. Under what circumstances were they built? In many cases, as a result of abusive practices, which included the illegal use of building machinery, transport, vehicles, building materials, manpower from factories. We had to severely punish several managers, some of whom were even expelled from the party. But, but, to make sure that, you know, you get the complete picture of how these self-proclaimed socialist leaders who cared about the people and totally, you know, got their wealth by shooting millions of people and, you know, doing a lot of terrible things and essentially driving the the nation to poverty, which we have a hard time climbing out of, uh, in the Eastern Bloc in general lived, and not just in the Soviet Union. Here is uh, here is an excerpt from a paper written by one Dr. Kelly Hignett, who is a historian and a lecturer at Leeds Beckett University. <clears throat> the conditions of general scarcity and shortage that predominated during the early period of the post-war reconstruction, combined with the general feeling of insecurity and fear spawned by the Stalinist era terror as political purges swept across Eastern Europe, meant that in the 1940s, many newly appointed officials were keen to prove their loyalty to communism, through shows of sacrifice and austerity, and a result the accumulation of excessive material luxuries by the political elite was generally discouraged. However, even during these early years, communist bureaucrats enjoyed many perks, including a superior standard of accommodation and access to chauffeur-driven cars, special shops and restaurants. The gratuitous level of luxury enjoyed by some members of the Stalinist-era political elite in Eastern Europe has also been documented. 
One example is the opulent living conditions enjoyed by Bolesław Bierut, which was the leader of the Polish Workers' Party from 1948 until his death in March 1956, which was recounted in detail by Józef Światło, a high-ranking Polish security officer who defected to the West in 1953. According to Światło, Bierut's living quarters comprised, <clears throat> uh, comprised of, quote, no less than ten lavishly and lux- luxuriously furnished palaces, all fitted out with legendary magnificence. Vyatlo described Bel- Belvedere, a palace in Warsaw, that acted as Bierut's principal residence between 1945 and 1952 in more detail. Quote, Inside there is a hunting room decorated in pale brown, like the deerskin with which all the furniture, even the superb armchairs, are upholstered. Their backs are made of special wicker work, brought in, bought in India. Ebony furniture is upholstered with the best leather. Along one wall, on a low buffet, are selected southern fruits, imported from abroad, sweetmeats of all kinds, foreign cigarettes and selected fruit juices. Along another wall, on a larger buffet, are vodkas, brandies, liqueurs, foreign wines. And besides, b- beside the batteries of bottles, on foreign porcelain dishes and silver platters are caviar, smoked salmon, lobster, and the most delicate, called hors d'ovar, of meat and fish. An entire state apparatus exists to ensure that there should be no lack of the best and most valuable things at Com- Comrade Bierut's table. General Komar, head of the second department, used to send people to France specially to purchase wine and southern vegetables for Comrade Bierut and the party members. Shiatlo also went on to describe a similar, similar level of opulence at Conservian, Bierut's summer home. <clears throat> Quote, there are 18 rooms in the villa, all newly decorated. Bierut normally spends the summer there in rooms hung with old pictures and filled with carved masterpieces. He has at his personal disposal a tailor, a chef, a hairdresser, apart from about 230 servants in the little palaces and residences. Following Stalin's death in 1953, the extensive privileges enjoyed by the East European political elite became even more apparent. In East Germany, for example, the party leaders had initially taken up residence in a set of elegant villas located near the Schönhausen Palace, which was used at the offices of the head of state of the GDR, and then, from 1964, as the state guesthouse for visiting dignitaries. In Berlin. In 1956, however, the SAD leadership approved the building of a luxurious, secure living zone for the party leadership near Wandlitz, about 30 kilometers north of East Berlin. Construction of the Waldsiedlung complex was undertaken between 1958 and 1960. The completed complex covered a total area of two square kilometers and consisted of 23 luxury detached family houses, a clubhouse with a private cinema, a gourmet restaurant, a shop stocking a selection of luxury western goods, a market garden, a health center, a shooting range, a swimming pool, a sports field, and a several tennis courts. In 1970s, a new four-lane autobahn was also constructed to provide a direct connection between Waldsiedlung and Berlin. The area surrounding the complex was officially designated a protected area for game research, decreed off-limits to all ordinary Germans, and troops were stationed to guard the entrances to the complex, which could only be entered with special passes. The SED elite lived here in luxury from 1960 to 1989. SED leader Walter Ulbricht, who was the leader from 1950 to 1971, not only enjoyed the comforts of a magnificent 25-roomed house in Waldseelung, but also had a holiday home specifically built on the small Baltic island of Vilm, which was subsequently deleted from maps to avoid unwanted attention. Because why would reality ever influence the lives of uh, prominent, uh, prominent Eastern Bloc leaders? Many of the other East European leaderships followed suit and also built their own private luxury accommodation complexes. For example, those in Katowice in Poland, Buda in Hungary, Sose in Bucharest, and Bojano Knazeva in Sofia. Construction of these privileged communities were funded by state money, and because the apartments were given high-priority status, they were built to the highest standards, employing the most highly skilled craftsmen and using high-quality materials directly imported from the West. The complexes were naturally located in the most attractive and sought-after areas. In many cases, the land required was fraudulently appropriated, with claims that the land was needed to construct important public buildings, and, in cases where the desired area was already inhabited, the occupants were forcibly resettled irrespective of cost. Because, uh, obviously, in Soviet... In Soviet era, money 
Money is for the common people, those who actually care about how many things cost, and those who have to stand in line to have 500 grams of sausage in the stores. But for the leaders, you know, they say they get. Everything is just like that. And another historian, Hirschowitz, claims that by the 1970s, quote, <clears throat> The practice of occupying sites for hunting grounds, holiday homes, and sporting grounds to be used by the privileged few, usually higher officials, was very common. The users of these facilities often had at their disposal special transport facilities and personnel. For the more important ones, even airports and special highways and roads leading to remote spots were earmarked. One good example is provided by the case of Abramov, a village in southeastern Poland. Quote, the village was situated in the Bieszady Mountains, where a special microclimate favored a particularly fine breed of deer. The decision was made to use the area as a hunting ground for dignitaries. In 1968, 3,000 hectares were fenced off, and over the next few years this was increased to 7,000 hectares. The official reason was that the area was needed by the armed forces for strategic reasons. By 1980s, the hunting ground extended over 60,000 hectares, and the intention was to expand them further. Buffer, the buffer zones around the, around the hunting grounds were also fenced off, and the families living in these zones were <clears throat> compulsorily resettled. Those who compiled could move to towns where they obtained flat immediately, but those who resisted were removed forcibly during the night and dumped in one of the dilapidated houses in the mountains abandoned by the Ukrainian population in the late 1940s. Well, isn't that nice? And pressure was put on them to stop resisting the compulsory resettlement order. In the militarized zone, shooting lodges were erected, and special landing strips for planes were constructed to make access easier for the visiting dignitaries. However, however, besides all of this crazy opulence, which was um, which was the lifestyle of uh, the very socialist leaders, the greatest leaders on the planet Earth, who lived in there while the country was basically starving and didn't have enough money, and people literally uh, had to grow food themselves to feed themselves with this crazy opulence and everything. Perhaps the most extreme example of excessive elite privilege during the latter decades of communist rule in Eastern Europe was provided by none other than my dear Romanian friend Nicolae Ceausescu. School. The fact that the Romanian leader and his family lived in the lap of luxury while most ordinary Romanians lived under the conditions of enforced austerity and extreme repression, just like everyone lived in other socialist countries, struggling with deprivation and poverty has been very well documented. During his time as a leader from 1965 to 1989, Ceausescu owned 15 luxury palaces around Romania, including a riverside villa at Snagov, a lakeside resort at Cernavoda, a mountainside lodge at Brasov, and a Primaveri Palace in Bucharest, which had rooms filled with priceless silk, porcelain, marble, silverware, chandeliers, and carpets. Ceausescu also acquired a large collection of valuable gifts and trinkets from other world leaders, many of which included... <clears throat> Many of which, including a leopard skin, a pair of silver enamel doves, and an ornamental bronze yak, were recently auctioned off in Bucharest. Uh, recently, by by the by the publication of this article, mm. this level of luxurious living was even extended to non-human members of the Ceausescu family. Ceausescu's pet dog Corbu, who was by the way awarded the rank of colonel in the Romanian army, was often driven through Bucharest in a limousine accompanied by his own motorcade, and there are reports that the Romanian, Romanian ambassador in London had official orders to visit the United Kingdom's supermarket Sainsbury's every week to buy dog biscuits for Corbu, which were then sent back to Romania in the diplomatic bag. Now, isn't that amazing? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I will... Uh, Again, I want you all just accompanying this episode to listen to my Soviet Everyday Life episode, because otherwise I'm going to have to insert an episode within an episode and it's going to be terrible. But I highly recommend that after listening to all this situation, at this point, you stop this episode, you go back to my earlier ones, you listen to one about this everyday life in the Soviet Union, and then you come come back here. Because... <laughs> because I, I just don't want to repeat myself, and this episode is going to be quite long as it is. Now, please do that. And um, when you, once you come back, after you have listened about the stories of the insane lines, about people starving, about mass psychological catastrophes created by poor, poor, uh, poor, poor economical situation there, and about how people literally were stealing everything because there was nothing in the stores, you can come back here. And, uh, well, I'm going to continue on by talking about how, at the same time, 
The press depicted clear propaganda and a simply glorious way of life for the common man. Hi guys, this is Alice. Sorry if I sound a little sick. I am. Me and Christops would like to thank all of our listeners, and all of our patrons, and anyone who has ever supported us. Also, on the 21st of September, we're going to be in Stockholm. We will be arriving with the Tallink Ferry at 10.30 in the morning from the Vartahamen port. If anybody would like to meet us there, or show us around, hit us up. You can write to us on our Facebook or email, theeasternborder at gmail.com, and maybe we can meet. And lastly, we will be having an auction in the near month, so keep your eyes open. Thank you. And now, back to the show. So, here we go. This one is a fragment from an article in the newspaper The Star, uh, Latvian SSR edition, year 1953. January uh, edition about the glory for the workers in the USSR and how they have celebrated the new year. <clears throat> Quote, And the presents. How many of those are there this year? The following hours pass like a dream for little Alda. While she unpacks all of them, hours pass and the clock takes almost midnight. Normally, little Alda from the Gras family would be sleeping by now, but not today, as it is celebration time. Exactly in midnight, the family raises, raises their glasses and have a toast. From the family's radio, the sounds of uh, the sounds, the cheerful sounds of Kremlin's spokespeople can be heard. And at this exact moment, just like in every other Soviet family, the people think about whether or not they have done enough of their socialistic duty towards the motherland. Alexander Gras has nothing to be ashamed for. He has produced way over his plan while working in the VEF factory in the value of over 10,000 rubles. Uh, which is a ridiculously insane number, by the way. <clears throat> and if you calculate by the tasks given to him and how well he's performing, he is already fulfilling the plan and working and living in the 1960s. He is so far ahead in his productivity. So, be welcome, the new year of 1953. We have met and separated a long time ago already. And Alexander Gras, like millions of our glorious socialist Soviet state, full with confidence, enters the new year knowing that he will be able to fulfill his every desire and live a prosperous life, the likes of which were unheard before. As the midnight comes, he raises his glass in a toast for the motherland, the party, Stalin, work, happiness, and peace. Nice. And, of course, none of the propaganda materials will be complete if I didn't mention our old friend Anne Saxe and her writings here. Again, from The Star, this time 1952. She is calling here in this article for people to go to the Soviet elections and is obviously calling for everyone to vote for Stalin. And this gets pretty glorious, guys. <clears throat> Quote, the fake philosophers, writers, artists and scientists, hired by the capitalists, try to explain the suffering of their peoples by striding away from the true cause, the unjust way that their society works. They try to say that unemployment in their countries is caused by the overpopulation of the planet, which is why a war, according to them, is necessary, so that a lot of people would die, so that a part of the planet's population would no longer be there. And, and, and this is the best part of it. <clears throat> Pastors from all religions, from their podests in churches and mosques, praise global holocaust and extermination of the peoples and are praying for massive pandemics of deadly diseases to take place to serve their capitalist overlords. At the same time, they are hiding the results of the glorious science from their peoples about the endless possible fertility of various soils, according to which, under the guidance of the wise comrade Stalin, the Soviet Union will conquer back from nature 28 millions of hectares of land from swamps, deserts, and steppes, and with that will be able to feed, clothe, and build apartments for no less than 100 million people. And she's not even joking there, because Khrushchev in the 60s did uh, did plow the steps of the Soviet Union, which uh, sadly didn't feed anyone. It caused a massive ecological catastrophe, and they also tried to, to turn turn uh, the rivers uh, in an opposite direction. But uh, I, I think I'll, I'll get to that in, in the follow-up to this this episode, as it's going to turn into a mini-series. But don't worry, we'll get back to Stalin eventually. But uh, this they really did this! They really did this. Now, the thing is that they conquered back stuff from nature, which was a terrible idea, but they didn't feed anyone. By, by Khrushchev's era, they couldn't grow enough food themselves, so they had to buy it from the United States. 
And actually, the United States had <laughs> really just stopped sending grain for stuff to the Soviet Union. It probably would have collapsed earlier. Uh, even including if you would send like more more jeans and more stuff, and that's actually really sad. But I have to drive all this thing together because we have been going on for a while now in this episode, as it's, as it's really getting a bit bit too bit too long. But but I have to give you one another article, and here's one from the April, uh, also 1953, the Star Magazine. Also, I I'm just I'm just pulling those out because I have access to 1952 to 1955 editions of this newspaper. So here it is. <clears throat> Like day against night is our everyday life when compared to the life of the workers in the capitalist countries. According to the news from the United States Ministry of Labor, after the war, uh, World War II that is, prices for food have increased by 65% there. In Norway, in the past three years alone, from 1949 to 1952, meat has become 48.2% more expensive. Salo, 68% more expensive. Uh, and yes, I would, I would totally like to try out the magnificent, totally really existing Norwegian Salo. The thing that they're totally known for, and that is uh, obviously a staple of their diets. Yep, totally. Nor- Norwegian Salo is, is, is something amazing, and that they just, uh, you know, all Norwegians must consume so much Salo, that they don't care that it's actually 68% more expensive, uh, in comparison to previous three years. Norwegian Sala, comrades. Norwegian Sala. <clears throat> Fish have become 24% more expensive. Cheese, butter, and eggs, 30% more expensive. Bread, 33% more expensive. And other foodstuffs have become 31% more expensive. While clothing has become 40% more expensive. Now, obviously, the article mentions, uh, by the way, exactly zero Norwegian sources for this information. It, it must be the Americans from the labor ministry who supported this or something, but, uh, yeah. What, what sources? We don't need sources in the Soviet Union. <clears throat> and, and kind of carrying on. The same thing is happening in the United Kingdom, France, West Germany, Austria, and Turkey. The high prices and employment, together with the high taxes, are a terrible burden of the proletariat's shoulders. Somber today, and even more more bleak tomorrow, that is the everyday life for workers in the capitalist countries. While over here, caring about the people and lowering the prices is the endless work of our socialist politicians. And now I just want to mention here what, what this actually means, because, you know, normally in modern day world, like, your your people over there, if you, if you for example, look at uh, kind of social democratic countries, such as Sweden, with, with great social programs, socialism is tied to high taxes. Right? Because, you know, the government provides a lot of services, but they take in a lot of tax money. This didn't happen in Soviet era. There were no taxes in the Soviet era. You will be surprised, but the people didn't pay any taxes. There were no taxes in the Soviet Union. Everything was planned. That is why I'm saying that the money had, like, literally no no value per se, as such. It was just crazy. And uh, the, the way that people actually got taxed was considered crazy and actually anti-socialistic, which which could kind of make your make your eyes kind of twitch a bit at this point if you start to understand what's going on here. But yeah, I guess I'll have to I'll have to go with things and you see the all this. Po- po- I'll have to speak about these things in in the future a bit because um you know I'm getting a, a bit tired recording all day long now. But you see, uh, the the leaders essentially lived in terrible opulence, while the average workers, like the engineers, had a salary of um, of, of like 120 rubles, and the car cost 5,000 rubles. They couldn't afford cars for themselves, and, and even feeding your family was hard. And how was this explained? Well, obviously, uh, without any sources and everything, people weren't people weren't weren't even allowed to see the reality. It's like you don't like something. No, no, no. It's not like you you are poor now, you are actually way better off than before, and you are totally, definitely, definitely, totally way better off than everyone else in, in those filthy, filthy capitalist countries. And I presume that this is this is the same thing that goes on today in North Korea, and weirdly enough Weirdly enough, uh, a lot of these a lot of these things are also in modern day Russia well I'm well, well I well, which is why I said that this all is gonna tie in there. Russia is Immensely rich with natural resources, just like the Soviet Union was, and it's basically the same sources here. But the people who are actually, who are actually involved in state companies and actually are working for Gazprom for the gas or mining coal or something, they don't live very well. 
See, the average salary in Russia, according to available data on the internet and various research centers, is 25,000 rubles. That's about 360 euros. And even this is disputed, because if you read some online comments, people are happy to be earning like 15,000 rubles, which is even less, it's about 200 euros. Nothing has really changed, because in Soviet era, all the wealth was gathered from the country and all this product. Basically, Soviets produced stuff in various factories, mostly for useless reasons, and I'll explain why most of these factories actually were pretty useless in the continuation of this episode. But what happened there was that all the wealth from the massive country went to Moscow and St. Petersburg. And this is how it's happening even today, because if you, Moscow and St. Petersburg is not they have all, all the parts of Russia. Like, I have, I have friends here who, who are ethnically Russian, and they visit their, their uh, relatives in Novgorod. And people in Novgorod say, well, just stay out of Moscow. And they even, like, have this derogatory term for people from Moscow, because they say they're not Russians, they're Moskali. Which is a derogatory term denoting the people from Moscow who just take all the money and all this natural wealth and everything. <laughs> it's acquired by taxpayer money and it's given to the leaders. Not much has changed because, see, you can compare it to the Tsar, but if you think about what's going on there today, then yeah, it's very like in the Soviet system. And I want to finish this by explaining, you know, about, about this whole situation where people are really sitting down and, and having a lot of issues with this Olson's article, which I mentioned in the beginning. And I'll start with, and to tie this all together with the intro part, I'll start from two recent articles. First one is by the Moscow Times, was published in September 15, 2016, and it's called Even Ducks Live Like Kings at Russian Prime Minister Medvedev's Summer Getaway. And this was this was uh, originally published uh, in company with uh, op- op- opposition leaders Navalny's Anti-Corruption Foundation's investigative reports, which had very compelling documents. But uh, the article says <clears throat> the mansion is located roughly a kilometer outside of town of Plios, about five hours no- northeast of Moscow. That Medvedev and his family are regular guests to the residence was already known, but Navalny's group managed to record the first aerial footage ever published. According to the Anti-Corruption Foundation, and by the way, I've seen I've seen this movie, and you should go check it out on YouTube. Don't call him Demon. According to the Anti-Corruption Foundation, the whole compound is 80 hectares, a whopping 40 times larger than previously reported. The summer house also has its own marina and ski slope, not to mention three helipads, a special communications tower, an outdoor board for giant chess pieces, and, apparently, a home dedicated exclusively to ducks. The historical Milovka Manor House, itself guarded by an inner security fence, is the compound's main home. Navalny's group estimates that restoring the manor house and developing the remainder of the complex cost as much as 30 billion rubles, or $460 million. According to the Anti-Corruption Foundation, the real estate was acquired by the DAR, gift, the so-called Gift Foundation, with, with money, 33 billion rubles, or $506 million, which were allocated to charity by the shareholders of the Novatek company. Researchers say this money was also used to renovate the manor house and construct the new upgrades. The Dar Foundation, Navalny says, had close ties to Medvedev's wife, Svetlana, and the head of the organization's supervisory board at the time it acquired Milovka Manor was Ilya Yeliseyev, one of Medvedev's former classmates. After 2011, the compound was transferred to the Foundation for the Preservation of Historical and Cultural Heritage. In other words, the home doesn't formally belong to the Prime Minister, but he and his family regularly reside there, judging by the geotags added to, the, to his photographs on Instagram. According to Natalia Timakova, Medvedev's spokesperson, the Prime Minister has never owned or rented living space at Milovka Manor, though she confirmed that he has stayed at the house before, which is ostensibly why the compound has a special communications tower. And this is just Medvedev. This is not even Putin himself. Huh. For Putin, we have to turn to an article from theguardian.com in an article, Putin Holiday Mansion Revealed. This article was written by Howard Amos, a reporter from Moscow, and it's article written on the Thursday, 34, 31st August 2017. And this again has more uh, aerial footage from Navalny. See, from this article, 
The mansion, known as Villa Segren, is located on a picturesque 50 acre site on and around Lodochny Island in the Gulf of Finland. It was used as a backdrop for a Soviet TV adaptation of the Sherlock Holmes movies filmed in the 1980s. Drone footage of the site shows, uh, shows several large new houses, including the newly extended villa, a helipad, and a pier. Navalny said the site was heavily guarded, including by a large fence that locals were b and the locals were barred from the area. In the video, Navalny alleges that the property is owned by close friends of Russian president, but it's for his use. All evidence clearly points towards one of Vladimir Putin's standard corruption schemes. His personal assets are registered under the names of his close friends, those four guys mentioned in the beginning, who have become fabulously wealthy over the last 17 years. The land the property was built on is rented from Sergei Rudnov, a businessman, according to Navalny. Rudnov is the son of a friend of Putin's, and also worked for the Russian cellist Sergei Roldugin, who has known Putin for years and was, leaked, was linked to him in documents leaked in the Panama Papers to offshore companies, with cash, cash flows up to 1.4 billion pounds. 1.4 billion pounds, and that's actually money just stolen from Russians themselves, by the way. In a similar investigation into the ownership of Villa Sagren earlier this month, the liber liber liberal TV news channel Deutsch published design sketches for the interior of the secret dacha, which show a large indoor swimming pool and a richly furnished office with a double-headed Russian eagle engraved in gold above a desk. To work to fit out the property for Putin's use began after 2010, and the president <clears throat> has vacationed there at least once, Deutsch reported. <clears throat> and this, this article also speaks about Medvedev's Medvedev's mansion previously, and this article states that the updated price for the mansion, as this article is obviously newer, states that uh, Medvedev's mansion is worth 66 million pounds. And this is a bit crazy. And, after for all of this, real comments? Any responsibility? Political? No. At the time of this, Medvedev's spokesperson, by the way, said that <clears throat> it was pointless to comment on propaganda attacks from an, op op from an opposition figure and a convict. So there is no official reaction to any of this. There is nothing done here, and nobody cares. And nobody cares is something that we here in the Eastern Border know a lot. Because this nobody cares attitude... Yeah. We've seen that one before. So, this is where I'll let you this week. This is where, where I'm going to finish the episode. And... uh Obviously, we're going to continue this. We're going to go into more detail, and I will return to everyday life of the peoples, and I will explain what, what five-year plans were in the Soviet Union, and I will explain why most factories were useless, and I will explain some schemes, what were used back then to sell things abroad and, and basically steal money from the people, which is exactly what this so-called socialist government did in the Soviet Union and other Eastern Bloc countries. And also, we will take a look at some of the some of the schemes used today by Russian government. I, I, I hope I'm going to get this done in the next episode. And then, well, then in the future, I hope that we will return to Stalin, but I am just too deep in this to just let it go this way. Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed this episode. And, do свидания, товарищи. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Border. If you have any comments or specific details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, theeasternborder.lv, and we'll rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast? Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The Eastern Border salutes you. This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org for more shows like this one. The darkness awaits.